Well, good morning. <laughs> ah, lovely, lovely. Yeah. Well, what a retreat this has been, learning to open up and just relax and be your natural self. Uh, that's, the, that's the solution to any perceived problem, is to be who you are. That's, it's interesting that that is the, the solution. And now a lot of people are, are talking about the way the world seems to go with this thing called disinformation or misinformation, misdirection, so on and so forth. But I think it's just helpful to remember that, that the world's a, a reflection of consciousness of mind. So by being true to your inner guidance, by listening to your heart, by listening and follow, you are bringing the light. It's coming through you, through your mind. And it takes it away from thinking you have to change the world or correct something on the screen. I read today where um, it was Barack Obama was speaking at, um, uh, I think it was maybe Stanford University or one of the major universities and just was talking about all the seeming misinformation and disinformation and and in the end saying, well, you know, we can't blame the social media networks, we can't really blame uh, anything in the world for this uh, situation of, of spreading falsehoods or misdirected information because he said it's just the, the media and the social media just um, reflects and amplifies any prejudices that we already have in our mind. So it's, it's like that brings it back again to just looking within and, and being willing to give over anything that comes up as a, a judgmental thought or a, a prejudice in any way just to hand it over to the Holy Spirit and that's where the purification occurs. And in one sense, when things are amplified, we are more aware of them. So that is what, how we have to look at things. Is, is we live in a time where there seems to be a lot of extremes, and it's really just uh, a, an extreme call for love, <laughs> extreme call to, to be peaceful, to be the peace, and extend the peace. And, you know, in one sense, I, I know I've been traveling around the, the world for many years doing talks and retreats and so forth, but we're kind of entering more a uh, cloistered phase. And uh, I started hearing, I think last fall, I started hearing the word cloistered and then checking that out. Cloistered, cloistered, what's that? And then it was more just freeing the mind of, of all distractions. I like that. It's not so much a spatial thing of trying to shut yourself off from anything, which kind of is a historical definition of the word, but it's just freeing the mind of all distractions. Really having your mind be like on the beam, focused like a laser beam to be the love and the light and to experience the connection with our source. So, yeah, this has been really beautiful. Uh, this retreat was so intimate and so cozy, but also very fo focused. I think we were focused like a laser beam <laughs> through throughout those uh, movies. And then that coupled with the spaciousness here of this beautiful canyon and quietness and uh, the little critters, the deer and the little critters starting to come, I think because we had our first few warm days really warm days, then I uh, saw the hummingbirds were coming out and the birds and so that was a treat. It was like a little wink <laughs> from spirit, like here's some creatures to surround you with too in this way. So yeah, I feel like um, today we can have a an opportunity for kind of a closure for the retreat, but also if there's any topics that we did not get into or we got into and you got your, it piqued your interest. 
you thought, wow, I'd like to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> uh, we started to go into quite a few. And I think with that last um, movie, we, could, we got a bit into um, protectionism and, and the, the fury that's underneath, the rage that's underneath that protectionism. When we identify with a part of the dream and then we think we have to protect it or defend it, um, uh, we could see the Nicolas Cage character, Jonathan, was really acting out um, the protectionism, kind of in an extreme way uh, yesterday, whether it was seemingly to protect the children or or going after the angels <laughs> you know, with a gun, <laughs> a couple, a loaded gun a couple times, and a bat, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and running out there and smashing the bat on the tree. You want more of this? <laughs> you know, but it's it starts to be a little bit comical when you start to see how funny it is, you know, when we seem to believe that there's an external source of of evil, how bizarre that can go, how how you off, can go completely off the rails trying to protect or defend something that that's not there. And, you know, that's, that's uh, what I've always loved. I mean, even remembering um, uh, John Lennon's song, Imagine, you know, I mean, he was throwing out some interesting ideas back then. Imagine there's no country. I wonder if you can, nothing to kill or die for, a brotherhood of man. And, and different teachers throughout the years have really kind of uh, poked fun at this idea, identification, trying to identify with something, anything in this world really sets off defense mechanisms that aren't helpful. They don't really bring us peace. They just take our mind energy off into a wild goose chase, really, until we realize this is crazy. Time to stop. Oh yeah, come back. Come back inside. So I just wanted to open it up just as we're starting. Jeffrey's got the, the microphone and and the reason we use a microphone in these sessions too is because we record them for speakers. So it's it's really just to magnify your voice because that's probably the one complaint I've gotten over the years with speaker is like I can't hear the questioner. It's so frustrating <laughs> when <laughs> I hear this little whisper thing in the back and I was like, what are they saying? Somebody, one person was having so much frustration with Course in Miracles groups that I suggested she use Spreaker as her Course in Miracles group. And that, but that was her big complaint. I can't hear the questions and the comments enough. So that's why we do this. It's not uh, for any reason to put you on. It's like to become a star or something. But it's, <laughs> it's just because the people <laughs> definitely want to hear what you're saying. <laughs> so yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I have a I have a question. Can you can you talk about the part of the mind that wants to turn towards awakening? Because I just can feel like there's I can see that there's like a clearly egoic kind of part of the mind that's always commenting on everything. And then there's this like part of the mind that has like a lot of spiritual content that's like guiding, like suggesting, guiding, wanting God. And I, I just am like wanting to understand if that's like a part of the ego, like what is that part that wants God? You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. There is one part in the the workbook where Jesus talks about, he says, there's a little child in you and the child needs your protection for a while uh, to, to be itself. In other words, it needs, it needs quiet. It needs um, nurturing. Uh, it, he's using the word protection actually in a, in a helpful way there. This child needs your pr protection so that it can be itself. So I think you're just in touch with that part of you and and the most important thing is is 
not so much to define it, but to realize that that you want to lean towards it, you want to to uh, support it, you want to nurture it. You know, that's the the part. I know when I was in my twenties, uh, late twenties, when I came across a course in miracles, I I felt a draw towards towards the spirit and towards doing things that I felt like praying and meditating, reading the Course, things that would help me. But there, the other side, the voice was saying, are you crazy? You know, you're in your late 20s, this is the time when you have to establish yourself. You have to establish yourself, carve out your niche, um, provide for yourself. Um, you know, it, it was saying, be practical now, don't be thinking that you can just meditate, pray, read the Course, take walks, you know, do things like that. But, but I think once we do start to nurture that aspect and we start to lean in that direction and give it support, then that's, it's through the miracles, it's through the experiences we have and the expansion we feel that convinces us that we can indeed go in that direction. So I like to remember it as it's the Holy Spirit doing a convincing job with our mind. And our part is the willingness. And then the Holy Spirit takes it from there. All we do is we offer our spark of willingness, a little spark here, another little spark here, and then things start to expand. It doesn't mean the ego will stop, you know, its, its antics. You know, it will it will come at the mind and say, what are you doing? You're wasting time, you're wasting your life, where is this headed? What, what good is this going to help you? How will this help you survive? You know, it will come with all of its um, seeming uh, attacks uh, for going in that direction. And then, and yet, when we do go in the direction, we have experiences that that show us we're moving in a very helpful direction. So it's it's like we're collecting witnesses. That's what we're doing in this world. We're slowly, as we turn our mind toward the purpose of forgiveness and awakening, we start to collect w witnesses and their reminders. Like, okay, and there's even a part where Jesus says, you know, at this point you will not go on alone Mighty companions will go with you. And these again are symbols to our mind that that we're not alone, that we can collaborate, that we can communicate, that we can share. I think that's why even uh, with Paramahansa Yogananda before he passed away, he, he kind of foresaw that there would be little groups and communities, little groups of people coming together and it was the Spirit using that for reinforcement, for witnesses, to kind of give more and more witnesses of, oh, it's good, we can follow this, we don't, we don't have to constantly doubt ourselves, we don't have to constantly question ourselves, we can start to see the witnesses of uh, opening around us, and more and more it goes that way. So that was very important for me, I think that was one of the most important aspects of traveling and going wherever I was invited to course groups or into people's homes is that I'd started to feel this connection and feel these witnesses. And I, even my early days of travel and most all of my days were not really going, going in a commercial way of travel, to, like to hotels. Um, it was more going and being invited by people, people who would host me for a gathering and say, oh, stay with us and and share with us and we would we had a lot of kitchen table talks a lot of lunches dinners going out to cafes you know just picnics barbecues you know i had a, a two friends down in georgia um one uh, the the husband um he was about his name was jim he was about 6 feet nine or something like that. Uh, and he was a former priest. 
uh, and uh, he had his pilot's license, and so he would invite me, and he, he had married a woman after he decided to leave the priesthood. He married a woman named Catherine from Tennessee, and and uh, they had a nice big house in outside of uh, Atlanta, Georgia, so he would just constantly invite us to go down there. And it was always so fun, it's such an adventure, meeting the people. He would, he would say, um, he, he purposefully had a house built with a bunch of other f um, pilots. So they had, in, the, in their backyard, they had a runway, and they had airplane hangers, <laughs> and these pilots would, would fly their planes up. And, and up when I went there, he said, now come with me, I'm going to sh take you into the houses of all my neighbors. So just visiting him, he would take me around and I would meet all the neighbors. I would go in one house after the next, after the next. And then I would pretty much on a, maybe a yearly basis, sometimes even a little more, um, he would pull his little plane out of the hangar and we would do Course of Miracles gatherings in the under the the hangar, uh, and then at one point, you know, he was putting out David's coming, and we'll do sessions, and then we'll have lunch, and then uh, I'll take people up uh, into the sky uh, after our our lunch. David will be doing one on one, so he won't go up, but. But everybody else, so people were doing one-on-ones with me and then literally soaring through the skies around uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And there had been so many adventures over the years of just people who studied the Course and who just opened their hearts and opened their homes and, and would say, come and call people, invite people, and potlucks and picnics and and doing what we're doing here, just very intimate conversations where people could raise their doubts, their questions, their issues, very much like uh, in the days of Socrates, you know, very Socratic dialogues, very open Socratic dialogues where there was nothing forbidden. Ask any questions. It could be about metaphysics, it could be about transfer of training, it could be about how do I deal with this, this, this that's going on in my life where I'm having such intensity. I need some insight to kind of get out from under it. Like I'm, I'm, I'm held down by these issues in my mind and they seem to be very tricky. So we would take the time. There were times too where um, I was one time I was in Argentina and um, I stayed a little bit longer than I was supposed to stay, so that kind of uh, messed up the airline tickets to make it back to the Peace House. But when I finally, there was big floods and we were, we were flooded into a rural house, so we had a, a little gathering based on who, who all was stranded in there when the waters rose, we couldn't get out. So I said, this is perfect. Spirits brought us together to really look deeply at this. Um, two of the women that were there, they were like, yeah, I've got all kinds of issues with my husband, but I, I really needed to get away to, to join deeply and look at my mind with these. And so they called their husbands up saying, oh, we were out here with David and the if floods came and I can't come home. The, I, I can't get th past the river now. It's the river surrounded us, you know. What? Well, who's going to cook me food and who's going to clean and everything? You see the spirit orchestrated everything for the dismantling of the self-concept. And, and you start to just see that, that there are what seem to be external situations, but they really are, are answers to your prayer of your heart to really be free, to, to free your mind from these egoic beliefs. So anyway, I was down there when the river finally went down. We, my friend uh, Carrie and I were able to get to the airport and fly back. But all of our uh, flights uh, were were messed up because of that. So I called a friend of mine, um, Skip. I think he was probably in his late seventies, and he was living in the Tampa St. St. Pete area, St. Petersburg. And I said, well, Pete, I said, Skip, I said. Uh, 
well, I'm coming flying, in, flying into Miami, Florida, which is way down the bottom. Of, and I don't know how I'm going to make it, but I think I'm supposed to uh, go to Georgia. But all the flights were changed and everything. And and he, Skip was like maybe like 77 years old. I'll come and pick you up at the airport down there in Miami. 77 years old, hops in his car, not used to driving out of his own city, <laughs> drives all the way down to Miami, Florida, comes to a huge Miami International Airport, drives actually through the, the Everglades, you know, where all the alligators are. 77, picks me up, and then he, he said, this is great. This is this is an answer to my prayer. I've always wanted to just have you in a car for hours and talk to me. And I said, well, let's go. Let's drive north. So off we go, driving up, driving up north and everything. And we got up near the Tampa Bay area. And he said, now, where did you want to go? And, and I said, well, ideally up to uh, Atlanta, Georgia, so I can stay with my friends in Georgia. He said, okay, I'll drive you. So... <laughs> He drives me all the way from Miami, Florida, up to Atlanta, Georgia, 77 years old. We're chatting and talking, chatting and talking. And then when he got up there, he said, now what? I said, well, I'm going to probably do some gatherings. My friends Jim and Catherine, they have a beautiful hot tub. Let's, why don't we go and pray and meditate in the hot tub? He's like, oh, this is the best. <laughs> you know, just from his willingness. Just from his willingness, you know, I didn't even have any expectations that he would do that. But, but those are the kind of things that, that are the way the miracles play out. When you join in one purpose and you just let the Spirit direct the way, things just open up. Invitations come, things open up and open up on a daily basis. Things just start opening up because you're getting out of the mode of thinking, I personally have to do it. You just are saying, I'm willing. Okay, fresh new day, I'm willing. I don't know what the day is going to bring, but I'm willing. And then things open and open and open. And and so there's been, yeah, that's kind of been the way that it's gone. It's not, occasionally I would do like big Course in Miracles conferences and that I was invited to or, um, you know, long retreats, four-week retreats, six-week retreats, mostly doing what we've done here. I would just uh, pray and meditate and just enjoy a nice uh, drink and go down by the pool and sit in the sunshine during the day. Then we'd have a meal or a, pretty much a movie every night, except this would go on for like six weeks. <laughs> and then people's minds were like, whoa, I don't even know what I'm going to do next after I leave this island with you, <laughs> come away for an island for six weeks watch movies, have holy encounters every day, and then the mind starts to shift and shift into a very intuitive uh, mindset, an intuitive way of living. And then it starts to be natural. You know, before there was hesitations, before there was doubts, before there was, oh, I don't know how I can do this, or I don't know how I can make this practical. But by relaxing into it, uh, people would just go and would show up. I was telling someone recently, the last day or two, that one time I was up in Ireland, I think I was up in maybe Dublin, Ireland, and a woman came up there to do like a, a retreat of some days with me up there, maybe like a week, six days or a week, and she wanted to do a one-on-one -on -one with me, and then she said, well, you know, I, I just, I saw you on the internet, and I, something about your name, I was supposed to come from Mallorca, Spain, up to Ireland. And then when she came to Ireland, she was there for a number of days, she said, could I do a one-on-one -on -one with you? And, and then when we did the one-on-one, -on -one, she, she said, I, my main issue is, she said, five years ago, I gave my house over to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and I said, use it for your purposes. And I said, that's wonderful. So well, what's the problem with that? And she said, well, that was five years ago, and they still have not acted on it. I'm still there in my house waiting for Jesus and the Holy Spirit to use my house in some kind of way. And so the more she talked, I said, well, I, I'm i always drawn back to Mallorca. Um, where's your house? And oh, it's right, right outside of La Palma. Oh, okay, I said, 
She said, I actually have three houses that are all, three buildings that are all in the same thing. I said, wow, that's a great place for a retreat. Three houses in this in vicinity. Outside of La Palma, that's where the airport is, you know, La Palma. So I said, I think you're bringing this up to me now so we can set something in motion. Sure enough, we, was it a six, we did a six week retreat at her house and Kirsten's mother flew in early, was maybe a couple of weeks early to help organize the things that needed repairs and different things to kind of get it ready for a large um, retreat over six weeks. But, uh, and after the first one, she said, okay, I feel much better about that. I said, anything else? She said, yeah, I, I, want, I want to meet my soulmate. <laughs> I said, well, okay, we'll just move in this direction. And sure enough, when, when Jackie was over there helping get the place ready, this handyman showed up and she fell in love with the handyman in <laughs> getting prepared for the thing. And Jesus was like, okay, yeah, good whim. Helen Schuckman, she liked green pantyhose and Borgana coats. This woman wanted a soulmate and a retreat to be held at her property. And it just unfolded so beautifully. And of course, it was, it was so, so life-changing. I think that might have been the one, the last big one we did over there, where the, there, there was actually one woman who didn't tell anybody, but she came to, to the six-week... Uh, retreat diagnosed with cancer and at the end of the six weeks she was completely in remission the it, it was completely gone and then there were other things that that where people had like huge life changing kind of in their minds turnarounds in their their lives but the main thing is just to cultivate an attitude of willingness just to say i don't know the way but you do and so I will f be intuitive, I will listen, I will follow, I will, I will just show up, I will not try to determine the day, I'm not going to try to make a life plan, what I'm going to do the next five years or ten years, I'm just going to let you show me what to do. And I was playing that song, Let All Things Be Exactly As They Are, Really, the only way you can let all things be exactly as they are is you have to trust your intuition and you have to trust the unfolding of miracles in order to let go of, of investment in outcomes. Because it's the ego and the ego self-concept that sets goals every day. I need to do this. I should do this. Here's my to-do list. I need to get like eight out of ten things on my to-do list for it to be a successful day. You know, the pressure mounts when you have a list and you pretty much try to plan out each day by achieving your list. And there's a lot of reinforcement for that. That's what they would call successful. That's, that's how successful do it. Successful people do it. They do it by being very directed in their plans, sticking to it, developing discipline and so on and so forth. Whereas with the Spirit, it's more a discipline in prayer and and listening, inner listening. Not trying to jump in to do things until you really feel it. Like you really feel a swirl in your heart. You feel like a swirl of in inspiration. Which reduces this idea of coercion. It it reduces the resistance, it reduces all the ego's things that come up to try to prevent you from following your joy. You know, the shoulds, the ought tos, the have tos, the must, you know, locked in, feeling very locked in. So, I feel like that's, that's one of the key to let all things be exactly as they are, is, is you find you're maybe delightfully surprised at how fun life can be, how joyful, how effortless, how easy. It's quite a contrast to the old way, which was like, grind your way out, you know, just hang in there and grind it out, grind it out. And, and that's not really the way the Spirit wants to operate it. In fact, the more we start to turn it over, it does seem to be that things seem to just happen, and there's a lot of out-of-pattern experiences that just come but they're not shocking, they're just like pleasant surprises. Like, oh, that was easy. Or, wow, 
I can't believe this, this, this all came together. Like I mentioned that uh, phone call I did uh, a couple of days ago where just a, a friend of mine wanted to translate the ebook into Dutch. I said, I'll just make a little uh, messenger group and no one's online, but if it's just us two, great. And, it, and then ding, 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 they all joined in and we had a fun 10 minutes and gave her a boost of of joy about doing it. Like it wasn't a project or she wasn't in it alone. You know, there was a, a group of support immediately uh, that was brought in. And that's important too, because you don't want to feel like you're doing it on your own or you don't want to feel like you're, like you're Sisyphus rolling a boulder up a hill. That is really not enticing at all uh, for the spiritual journey. And, and many times people believe like it's going to be a, a harsh, difficult, uh, rigorous journey with the Spirit. And I find when I really had the willingness and I just relaxed into it, it wasn't that at all. It was more like rolling the boulder down the hill <laughs> or trying to keep up with the boulder. You give it a good push and it was off. <laughs> You've got to go running down the hill to even keep up to the boulder. So it's a lot different than Sisyphus, but but that I think is also important. You know, it keeps you lighthearted, it keeps you laughing, it keeps you even more willing to be open to whatever's going to come your way. You know, you're like, oh wait, can't wait to jump out of bed. What's going to happen today? You know, it's it's exciting, and that's the way to go go at it. So that's a long answer to your <laughs> your call for how to nurture that part of your, your mind. David, I've heard you mention a, a word numerous times, two words, transfer of training. And I, I think I have an idea, but I'd love your definition of that. Yeah, I think it's, it's when we start to open up to the Holy Spirit's purpose and we cease making exceptions to the practice of the workbook idea. So, the, the, basically the workbook, it, it only has two guidelines, which is amazing for such a powerful workbook, you know, don't do more than one lesson a day, and as best as you can, try not to make exceptions to the idea. You may not believe these ideas, you may uh, have resistance, uh, you, you may actively resist the ideas, it does not matter, just do them. And that's really just saying, like, just by doing them and practicing them, little by little it starts to transfer to different aspects of perception, maybe that were held apart, obviously, from the idea. So, with a particular person or a particular situation, the the idea, like Lesson 48, there is nothing to fear, and then when you get to Lesson 48, then things that seem to be fearful come up during the day. And then you really have to make a decision if you're going to come back and really go toward the, that lesson, there's nothing to fear, and or you're just going to try to react and respond <laughs> and, and handle based on the old way, you know, trying to defend against the fear uh, through some way, which is really not what we're asked to do. We're just asked to hold that lesson like a torch and then let the, the light. I like the idea too of a lighthouse, you know, how you've got a, a lighthouse and you have this brilliant light and then it has to sweep around. I always thought of transfer of training as, okay, let's do a full 360 sweep here. And then when you're willing to do that, then you do notice pretty quickly where there's a desire to hold an exception to the lesson. And he tells us, it's basically, it's not that the lessons are cumulative, which in typical uh, exercises and typical learning as the world presents it, um, learning is definitely um, cumulative. You know, like even with mathematics, you know, you start off with your you know, your addition, subtraction, and you work into your multiplication and division, and then you move maybe into uh, algebra, and before you get into trig trigonometry or calculus and things like that, you, it's very, very cumulative. 
it would be ridiculous to think you can start off with 1 plus 1 equals 2 and then move into trigonometry or calculus or things like that. But Jesus stresses that his workbook lesson and his, so to speak, learning and mind training is, is not cumulative, but it, it will, once you transfer the training of his principle, without making exceptions, it will transfer to everything and everyone, without exception. So, it's again, it's instantaneous, it's, it's simultaneous, it's, it's not this long cumulative thing where you build and build and build and build, it's actually uh, how willing am I to not make exceptions to what he's offering me, that brings about the, the transfer of training. And so, when I look back at the parable of David, I think, you know, it, after like five years of really immersing with the Course, that's when Jesus was, was saying, you know, we're, I'm going to take you traveling. And I was like, traveling? I don't, I don't even like to travel, and, and I don't have any means to travel. And, and oh, I mean, all the objections came up, and, and he said, yeah, that's precisely why we're going traveling. I need to teach you to help, to listen to what I'm offering you, my instructions. I, this travel is about showing you divine providence, that I will provide for you, because there was all the typical questions after all the years of education and ten years of university. Where will I go? He said, I will tell you. How will I get there? I will provide for you. Where am I going to sleep? Uh, I don't have any kind of um, savings. I don't have any kind of church support. I have, I have no visible means of support. He said, yeah, isn't that wonderful? That's the best way <laughs> for you to become dependent on my guidance. The best way for you to get into listen and follow uh, and let me provide for you every day. Because those seem like really basic practicalities, you know, what am I going to eat, where am I going to go, where am I going to sleep, you know, how is it going to go? And, and basically he was saying, I will just, let's just take it one day at a time. And yeah, that was a period, I think it went on for almost five years, um, of like travels, lots and lots of travels, a big trip for five and a half weeks, a little pause, then a trip for six weeks. But it, it, um, it was a real good mechanism for me of getting into transfer of training. Because I was used to trying to control the variables of where I would live, who I would interact with, you know, everything. I, I was very much trained and conditioned to, to be in charge. And this was more of a faith building, trust building exercise. So, uh, and also, I think it was also to kind of slowly bring me out of this, this shyness that I had in my self-concept. You know, meeting people, the scenes changed so fast. Every day it seems like the scenes were changing, the people were changing. There wasn't a lot I could um, hold on to, because everything was changing so fast. And that was, I think, part of the transfer of training. It was more like helping me become God-dependent, or really reliant on, on the Spirit's voice. Years later, when I had the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment, um, I was shown this movie that was very, very helpful. Uh, Kevin Klein was, uh, was one of the main stars, and it was called Grand Canyon. And um, he he was coming home from a Lakers game in Los Angeles when his car broke down in, he was trying to cut through the hood <laughs> to make it home. Uh, make it home because there was such a big crowd, he got out of the Lakers game late so he's, he was kind of going through the, through the hood. That's when his car broke down and this street gang comes up to him and uh, he's they're like really on him, and then they pull out, I think they pull out a gun. They're just, it's just a, a confrontation. And um, he's kind of like saying to himself, Mayday, Mayday, 
I'm going down, I'm going down. And then suddenly, this tow truck pulls up, and uh, the actor Danny Glover, a uh, black man, comes out. Hey, what's going on here? He's like a, like a divine intervention, uh, coming there almost like an angel um, to diffuse the whole situation. And, and the, the, the gang members are even kind of on him, too. And he said, hey, I'm just doing my job. Let me go my way. You know, he, he just starts hooking the car up <laughs> to the tow truck. He knows what's going on, but he's just... And then they have a deep friendship in which the, their whole world starts to shift and dismantle as they... Uh, Kevin Klein's uh, his wife, um, she has a powerful experience when she's out jogging and she she finds a baby in the woods and brings the baby home and Kevin Klein's like, what are you doing? You can't just, whose baby is this? You know, she's like, oh, I just, it's so sweet. I've always wanted a baby. And Kevin's like, what? So he's, I mean, it's such a good movie. It's a dismantling movie. Uh, but it's really well done about um, getting out of the comfort zones. His his cell phone won't work. He's in the hood. He has his car breaks down. Yeah, those are some of the cell phone breaks. This doesn't work. Car breaks down, and then you're just wide open. You need to trust. And their relationship is that connecting trust, which then starts to transfer uh, to dismantle their perceptions. So. I think that's how the transfer of training works. You know, it's it's you you have a prayer in your heart, and then circumstances start to <laughs> nudge you <laughs> towards the transfer. Yeah, and then when waiting, rather than fixing it so quickly and going for a, like I can fix this, I can get myself out of this. It's just delaying the transfer. Then yeah, that's it. When we try to use past learning to try extract ourselves based on our past learning, then. All that ends up doing is reinforcing the past learning and the belief that we need the past. You know, we, we aren't letting ple present trust direct the way. And yet the miracle is just that. It's just saying, you have present trust and, and everything that you need will be given you. And it will be replenished. Jesus tells us in the the section when he starts talking about the, the real world, he says, the Holy Spirit will take nothing from you as long as you have need of it, and will renew it for as long as you have need of it. But the Holy Spirit would not have you linger in time. So there's the nice thing. Holy Spirit will provide everything, will renew it as long as it's necessary, and the Holy Spirit would not have you linger in time. In other words, it's not going to let the ego jump into this and turn it into the manifesting <laughs> kingdom, you know, where it's like, I've got a new career, I'm a, I'm a manifester, you know, and, and, and then suddenly the ego has hijacked all of this beautiful divine providence that was helped, designed to help free the mind. And then it tries to, yeah, look what I did, you know, join me for only ninety nine ninety five. You can, you too can learn how to manifest, you know, it, it you know, it, it just turns it into multi-level marketing, you know, it will take something that's so miraculous and it will try to just apply multi-level marketing to, to it for its own purposes. The ego still is trying to maintain a separate will. Uh, it still wants to have a separate autonomous will, and it wants to have a successful separate <laughs> autonomous will. And, and that can go along. We, we all know the stories, you know, different ones of Howard Hughes or uh, Dale Carnegie, or there's just so many that that will have a turn. Uh, I I just got a kick. I mean, over the pandemic, the, the kind of things that give me a, a like a, a laugh and a, a, a real sparkle in my heart was, you know, it was like in these recent years with the pandemic, um, the richest man in the world, Jeff Bezos uh, from uh, Amazon, got a divorce. And then uh, his his wife, they got a divorce, then she changed her name back to a name that, that her grandfather had had, and uh, 
I think it was Mackenzie Scott, Mackenzie Scott. And she just went to town giving money. I mean, millions and millions and millions. I, th I don't know, it might have even been, up, it, it might have gone into the billions, I'm sure. It, she just started right during the pandemic when everybody was having the most difficult time, she just started giving these grants of, of money. And and she kept going and going and going. There was a there was a group of, of wealthy people, you know, uh, that um, Bill Gates uh, and his wife and Warren Buffett and everything. They had come together and they had said, "We have so many, you know, billions of dollars that why don't we agree to start giving it away?" and let's give half of everything that we own and possess away to charity. Well, Mackenzie Scott, she started giving away like there was no tomorrow. And somebody asked her one time, are you part of this club that you're going to give half of, now that you got half your divorce settlement, <laughs> now that you're, you're one of the richest women in the world, uh, are you going to give half of it away? And she said, no, that's not my philosophy. My philosophy is give it until it's gone. <laughs> I'm like, whoa! <laughs> she's, she's breaking the mold. Give it until it's gone. You know, and then you read in the Course, you know, the number seven um, in the characteristics of God uh, is generosity. And Jesus says, the teacher of God does not want anything that he cannot give away. What would he want it for? He could only lose because of it. So Mackenzie Scott is slipping into number seven, into true generosity. And, you know, she went to school in the Ivy League and, and as a, to be a novelist and a writer. And, that's what she's doing. While she's giving away these billions of dollars, she is writing novels. She's just doing everything that she always wanted to do. <laughs> and uh, I think she, she did get remarried to a chemistry teacher. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> this, and I said, I, what's this guy? Chemistry teacher. And they said, well, he's the kind of guy in his classroom um, he would go around all day long giving high fives to the the students and the other teachers. And I'm like, whoa, Mackenzie, she's just swirling back towards God because she's give it away and 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 until there's nothing left. You know, give it all away. Basically, that's what she's doing with her money. That's that's I don't think the world has seen that kind of philanthropy. And during these uh times, you know, this these recent years with the pandemic, you know, this is like a time of extreme need. A lot of the groups she's picking women's groups, uh LGBT groups, you know, she's going for the ones <laughs> that are like right on the edge and she's funneling the money right where she really feels it's needed. And you know, writing her novels and um, I think just having a wonderful time of it, you know, just, she's just really going for it. But that's a good example of the direction that your life will go in. You know, when Jesus says the teacher of God does not want anything that he would not give away, you get into that spirit of joy and gen true generosity where it's just like moment by moment, Jesus says, I have to show you the way with this. You know, you, your past conditioning is so different from this. I mean, there are people that that have criticized Mackenzie and just said, oh, she's she's, she's a loose cannon. She's she's lost it. She's completely lost it. She's, she's going against capitalism. She's going against entrepreneurialism. She's going against the foundations of, of, of society in this country, the whole system. But, but I, think, I don't think she's concerned in, in the least bit. You know, I think she's happy and, and probably every day getting happier and happier and happier with, with this direction of her life. Because she actually came from a very privileged... Um, 
she came from a privileged family, I think, in the East East Coast, and um, and she went through that whole thing where you know she had to start to break away from her family's money, and um, she was just you know barely making it uh, when she was in university, just trying to barely waitress tables and just get enough money to uh, to stay in the university. And then she had a, a writer, a very good writer, who took her under his wings and really helped her develop her writing skills. But she's been, you know, through it, through a lot of things. And then through all these things, she had to really just pray, I think, and say, now what do I really want to do here? What wh This is my life. I'm, what am I going to do with it? And and what direction do I want to go in? And and I feel like that's that's just an example too for everyone, you know, because she's always trusted that that things are going to be provided. She, when she used to, I, I even before she uh, met and married Jeff Bezos, she she loved telling like a like, like a Mexican story. I think it was of. It was about divine providence. She would just tell this every time somebody would write her, invite her to a radio interview or something. She was telling this story of divine providence, and now she's in it. She's right in it. She's she's letting it move through her in a way where she's feeling authentic with it. She's feeling good about it. She's not. She's like taking that little parable that she loved to tell, and she's now inside of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she's adopted it. So I think that's kind of the direction we go. Where It's more like you're just saying to Spirit, you orchestrate my day. You show me what is most helpful. And then when you start to relax into that and things start to come show up in such delightful ways and sometimes unexpected ways, and yet you feel like you're being carried, like there's some kind of a giant hand under you, just kind of carrying you from scene to scene to scene, then that's when you're really getting into the experience that Jesus is pointing to. That you're just, you're, you're God dependent, you're, you're intuitive dependent, you're spirit dependent. And if you're that, you can't be ego dependent too. You know, the ego is just past learning. You know, fall back on this, fall back on plan B or plan C or you know, oh, uh, store away for a crazy day and then fall back on your, your defense plan. You know, no, this is, this is not that. So, yeah, I think it's exciting. I, I've enjoyed following what I have seen of Mackenzie. <laughs> Look at her go. She is having some fun. <laughs> yeah, it's our, our master, our, our master, our master trainer is one we can't see. Yeah. And we want to be the master trainees, then. Yeah, yeah. that's it. That's yeah. it. Thank you. Beautiful. I'd like to ask a question that feels like it's just for me, but I, intuitively, I'm I'm thinking it's not. Um, watching the movie yesterday, I'm sitting here going, I'm shaking my head, I'm going, yep, I've had that call, yep, I've seen that before, and I'm going. Like, how do I get out of this feeling of being specific in the exposure of what I see and what I've seen? And my mind's going, do I want to get rid of my memory? Like, it, it just feels very exclusive. You know, I'm, I'm thinking it's probably 10,000 plus times I've seen trauma. And I'm going, is that any different from a person that had two or three traumas in their life and it, they just keep playing it in their mind? And I'm going, okay, so the question is not just for me. It's something else to watch a movie. And I'll, and I'll say, and I'll just say it because seeing trauma over and over again was unbelievably interesting. It was absolutely fascinating. But the way my mind is unwinding 
It's going, am I ever going to feel the same like everybody else with that in my memory? That exposure, that repetitive exposure. They weren't just my traumas. It felt like they were other people's traumas that I was witnessing or being a part of. So it's a very, it feels very unique. Unless I'm talking to, you know, 20 odd, you know, emergency service workers, you feel like you can't really relate and again, I go back to, is it any different from one major trauma with a person and they just keep repeating it? So I was wondering if you can expand on that for everybody, not just for me. Yeah. Yeah, I had a, um, I had a dear friend who, who had been in the military and experienced a lot of what you're talking about. And, and then he became like a, a medic. Um, that was on call when there was these extraordinary emergencies and he would be hop right in the helicopter and go right to the scene. So he had a similar experience with so many of these seeming traumatic uh, experiences. But, but uh, he was always... Um, very curious. I, I think he, he thought of it more as like a, a vast accumulated amount of, of these uh, memories and, and things that he'd witnessed, like a big vault of things. And, and, and it was quite e extreme. But I do remember when he first started to get so curious about the course and wanting to join with me, he would, he would come and uh, to stay at a little hermitage I was staying with in Michigan or take a take a road trip with me or whatever and um even one time we went to the just went into a mall for a day and then another day where he just we just walked around the mall and he just asked one question after the next and he was so sincere and so curious that that when he would ask all these questions and the spirit would come through me. He would sometimes have to pause and his eyes would squint and he would start going like this. Like, like he's got to make more room in his brain. Like, whoa. Go, oh, it's just a moment. Like, make room, make room. And, um, and, and that was helpful. Uh, for him because it set him his mind in a direction it's it's really that that we're trying to free our mind from from the interpretation of victimization we're trying to free our mind from this like really kind of we'll say bad habit of interpreting abuse and victimization and and maybe even the extreme forms of it we could we could say it's the same idea but but there can seem to be many extreme forms and and so i remember with thomas it was always this sense of like re interpreting he felt like everything we were going through was a reinterpretation reinterpretation and um and after all of that after having been in the military and uh and having worked as a medic, he, he had a job one year where he was um, out in Salt Lake City and he was, um, he was working as a nurse in a, in a facility, as a male nurse. And, um, and I had just gone in Cincinnati to see The Matrix. And I just kind of was so touched by The Matrix movie that I remember I came home and and I I called him up and I said, whatever you're doing, wherever you are, drop it. Stop what you're doing right now and proceed immediately to the theater and and see the matrix. And he did. He followed, just like Neo does at Morpheus. He he told his supervisor, oh, I, it's an emergency, I have to leave. He, he walked off his job, he went to the theater, and he was just like sitting maybe in the front row with Trinity and Morpheus and all of them, and just going, whoo, whoo. And then he just called me, whoa, whoa, 
whoa, you know. And, but that was just his curiosity, even though he'd been through those experiences with the military and as a medic, quite a lot of them, um, it was just like, okay, uh, like my friend Dorothy would say, so what? Now what? <laughs> that was her philosophy. So what? Now what? You know, she was, it's like a reorienting to now is too important for me to, to hold on to the past, to, you know, go through and rehash the past over and over. Because that is the ego's uh, plan of defense against the holy instance. Just rehash, rehash, rehash relationships, rehash particular scenes. Coulda, woulda, shoulda, if only I had done this, if only I'd taken this different turn. You know, it's a sad story. You got to get the violin out uh, with that one because it's just, it's a sad, sad story. Uh, but once you start to realize the, I'll call it the hope of release, then you, it's like you want to put all your energy towards that. And that's what Thomas did. You know, he was, he was quite curious. He, he would ask and ask and ask and ask. Even the, the, I was with him in the early years in the mall with a, another friend of mine, and and he would he would turn to her and he would say, "Why did you get that cup of coffee just now? Was that is that a preference? What's the difference between a guided <laughs> a guided coffee and a preferred coffee?" And I said, "Well, there's a lot of difference uh, between that, but." That's where you have to let the miracles be involuntary. You know, he says miracles should be involuntary. They should not be under conscious control. So you see, it's not about the person trying to be the miracle worker. It's about just easing back and, and having that prayer of trust, like show me, show me, show me. Uh, and then enjoying the, the laughter that, that comes with it. I remember, uh, when I went to see Thomas when he was up in Michigan, um, Traverse City, Michigan. <laughs> That's for you, Dave. <laughs> and so I went to visit Thomas and Trevor. He said, oh, I've got a new girlfriend, Nava, and, and uh, this and this. And so, uh, you want to come? You want to come? Uh, we'll, you can come visit. We'll cook you dinner. So I, I got there and then Nava got me aside and she said, Thomas completely adores you. He idolizes you. I'm cooking dinner tonight. I feel like I'm cooking for Jesus Christ or something. It's really ridiculous. And and she said, so what are you guys going to do? And I said, well, we'll just wake up and tomorrow and see what happens. And what came in was for us to go to the mall. And she said, the mall is the haven of the ego. It's, <laughs> it's the haven. It's it's materialistic, you know, she was much more into organic and simplicity and a hippie. She was like, Nava was a hippie and she's like, you're going to the mall? Of all places, you, are you going to go worship the ego for three or four hours? And I said, well, you know, for me it's just all a backdrop. I, I don't think of places as, as ego. <laughs> I, I feel like every place is a place to shine the light. And so we went there and he was asking questions and, and I was talking to him the whole time. But we were just having fun. We had fun with, with the children we met. We had fun with the people. We were so playful and fun. We went there to the mall to extend. Uh, we weren't thinking of it as stimulation or materialism or projecting meanings onto it. For us, it was just another backdrop to have some fun and extend a lot of love and joy. But those are the kind of things where day to day, as you practice, you, you get opportunities to, to start to leave behind this idea that certain people, places, things are keeping, blocking you or holding you back. Or even that certain things are traumatic and certain things are, are just calm, everyday experiences. You know, that dividing line between the, the traumatic and the, the common. Because I have let the transfer of training just continue in my mind, so there have been a lot of experiences where if someone was there with me, they would probably say I was 
witnessing something that was extremely traumatic, but it wasn't traumatic at all to me. I, w I was just, you know, I'm, I'm actually kind of drawn towards some things that people would say, you better stay away from. I, I actually am drawn right into it. Like, uh, I remember my friend Resta, who received like 270 songs from the angels, she she said, I had a dream with you, David, and, you know, and and I was there with you, and I said, what are we going to do today in the dream? And I said, oh, let's go f flying on our magic carpets. She said, so David, you had a little blue uh, magic carpet, and I had a pink magic carpet. And we took off flying in our magic carpets, of pink and blue, and flying around. And we're flying around, flying around, and then we're flying, and she looked down, and it looked like, like a gang war. Like, there was a gang of people, and they were really violent. And she wanted to immediately steer our blankets away from the gang war. And I said, no, no, no. That's the best. And she said, what? And I said, no, let's fly down there. And she, no. And so we flew down there and I, she said, and I landed and I looked at the, the gang or whatever and I, I threw my, my blue blanket and it just went over the whole scene and everything became still. <laughs> and another friend of mine, Lila, was said when she would, had these scenes where we would be going and she would be, it would be like a war scene and, and I would be like Morpheus, just stay here, stay, wait, now let's go. And we would go. So there was one time when we were, we were down, we, we were a group of us were over in China and um, we were supposed to be after a whole tour of China, we were supposed to be going back to Shanghai to catch our flight to uh, back to the United States. And we're in the plane, we're supposed to be heading for Shanghai. And then I could hear on the pilot saying, as I'm talking to my translator, uh, we're sorry, but our, our plane has been diverted. Usually that's not a good thing <laughs> in China. I'm like, ooh. This is an adventure. The plane's being diverted in mid-flight to Ningbo. So we went there and we landed and um, I was in the airport and the, there was a group of business people, I think, that this was like a Sunday night, and they, they were trying to get to Shanghai for business meetings on Monday, but they didn't make it. They got to Ningbo. And so... They were so angry. I was over in China and it was an angry mob. It was at, at the airport. They were just fuming mad. And they would go up to the, the, the two operators, that were the, the airline representatives, were, and they would just scream, scream, scream at these two uh, representatives. Like, no, we have to get there. Yeah. And I would just watch from a distance and then their shoulders of the airplane representatives would just kind of go down as they were just being screamed at and screamed at. They would come and then they would come and take those away. They would bring in two fresh ones and they would scream <laughs> and scream and scream at them until their shoulders went down. So anyway, I was with probably five or six people at the time, but I I thought I looked over there and I thought I've never been inside of an angry mob, I think. <laughs> that, that, I just would be so cool. <laughs> so cool. So they watched me go over there and I worked my way into the inside of the screaming mob. Now, I was about a foot taller than <laughs> everybody <laughs> there, so I really had a good view. I could go like this and see there. But, and then I would look out at my friends and I'd go like this. <laughs> But when your mind gets still, then you, you just, you see that you bring the light, you bring the calm wherever you go. You know, it's not about avoiding traumatic or angry, difficult situations. It's more, you, you are the light. You are the light of the world. Jesus says, you know, you are, I am the light of the world is a, is a workbook lesson. And he says, and you bring that light with you wherever you go. And, and that's a turnaround from the way we've been conditioned and raised. You know, we, we're, we've been conditioned to survive. We've been conditioned to avoid um, violence, maybe, or uh, avoid situations that we judge. But in the, in the rules for decision, Jesus is basically saying, 
you know, do not attempt to judge the situations that come to you. Be clear of your purpose and ask for what you should say and do. And that directs us to be really in intuitive, to live like from the inside out instead of from the outside in. If you live from the outside in, you just react and respond. And it's very stressful. Yeah, this world is extremely stressful if you're trying to live from the outside in because that's not how the mind works. It's, it's all being generated from the mind. And that's where we need to keep our, our awareness, you know, is, is with the Holy Spirit. So I think, yeah, you're just on a great adventure now, and George, and, and it's like you can kind of say, well, that's the way it was. And I don't have to start, a, even have a story with how unique and different that was, because that can just turn into a pride uh, very easily when we're proud of anything in the past. You know, it, it turns into some kind of a false identity attachment anyway. And just to have that open curiosity of like, okay, that's the way it was, but here I am now. And I'm going to use this moment and these moments for health, for happiness, for peace, for light. And when you put your mind to that, then, then that's what happens. It, things do turn around. And there will come a point where, where you won't feel the association with, with those memories. You know, they won't, they won't have a sense of ownership with those memories. They will, they will fade, fade away. There'll be other experiences that will come and take their place. So they will be, your mind will literally be vacated of those traumatic memories. Because you're being vacated of, of, a, of a false interpretation is really what's happening. That's really what it is. It's not so much the memories as if they're individual memories, but it's more the interpretation starts to, to swing around. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Nani's got a question. So what you said at the, kind of like at the end, remind me, reminded me of this idea of, um, is this in the same degree, no? How the outside, the outside, the outside, the outside, the outside, as if it were the real, in the same way, how we tend to find salvation also in the outside so-called world as a real thing in, let's say, with different gurus or religions, you know, like finding salvation as if salvation were in the world. So you just, I just had this, um, and as much as I love you with my heart like fully expanded i will not i feel that i will not take you as a david hofmeister or even the idea of paramahansa yogananda or krishnamurti sitting by your side imagine you no know, that i'm seeing three of you guys there it's not the body it's not the david hofmeister you know it's like what's I just felt what you were speaking, like this <sighs> sensation of, it's not outside. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It, it. Jesus says in the Course, only the mind needs to be salvaged, and it's only salvaged through peace. So that makes everything so clear. You start to see and perceive everything. You start to think in terms of the mind, the mind, I mean, the holistic mind, you know, full, complete mind. And, yeah, the, there's, you know, even the, the Course says uh, about Jesus, the man was an illusion. I mean, you know, the, if the, they wonder why Christians have trouble <laughs> with the Course. That's a pretty strong statement, the man was an illusion. Because he seemed to have a separate self walking among other separate selves, but, but that was just the symbol and he's always calling us to, to accept the salvation within, you know, that the salvation of the world depends on me, is, is a workbook lesson. And that really is talking about me, the mind. It's not talking about me, the, the person. So I think it's, it's good because you don't want to 
lift anybody up and you don't want to put anybody down. Uh, you want to see them just as symbols that the Holy Spirit is using and nothing more or less. It's just that in this world the ego will, will try to make s something out of nothing. So for example, the body is a learning device. And Jesus is very careful, uh, even when he's teaching in the Course, to not over-evaluate himself or under-evaluate himself. And it's a good example for all of us that if this, if the body is just a learning device, then you don't want to give it more value than it has, and you don't want to give it less value than it has. And the value that the body has is just the purpose for which it's used. To, to use the body to go beyond the body. So you're not denying the body, but you're just saying, oh, it's a symbol. And that's why I love Jesus, he told the parables, you know, there was a man who had two sons, or, you know, he's got his parables, but it's the point, or the value, or the meaning that's beyond the parable. It's what the parable is pointing toward, is what is important. And it reminds me, um, my grandmother Lily and I, we had such a close relationship and and she was diagnosed in her later years with dementia and everything. We still, we had just always such a joyful relationship. And when she went into de dementia, she seemed to lose all of her short-term uh, memory. So she couldn't, like I said, couldn't remember who she had breakfast with or anything like that. But there was times when we'd come together and she would just start telling stories of things that had happened to her baby back in the 1920s or and before, and repeating the stories over and over and over. Some of you know if you've had parents and the repeating stories and they just over and over. But our relationship was so strong and we were so connected and I was so trusting in Jesus that one day Jesus had me say to her um, when she told the story, at the end of the story she was smiling, she'd probably told it for the maybe 700th time, she was just there all smiling and, and I was sitting with her and I said, I said, Grandma, I said, what's the point of that story? And she said, what's the point? I said, yeah, what, what's the point? What was the purpose of that story? She just told me. She said, wow, I don't really know. I don't know. I guess I like it. <laughs> and uh, so sweet. And I said, I said, well, you know, I'm starting to feel like that the most important thing of a story is the point or the purpose for the story. And she said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And I said, well, remember Jesus. She said, oh yeah, Jesus. I said, every parable he told had a point or a meaning behind it. She said, that's right. And I love that about Jesus. And I said, me too. I like that he always had a point to telling his story. He just wasn't talking to be talking. He had a point. She said, that's true. That's true. And she said, wow, I want to be like that. And I said, yeah, me too. So we, even though we had, a, she'd maybe told the story 700 times, Jesus came in and honored our relationship and honored our presence and honored our path and journey and he redirected it to such a point where we were both able to have this this great, great joining. And then the next time when I visited her, when she started to tell the story, she just got maybe the first three or four words out. I said, wait, what's the point? She went, that's right, this has to have a point. You know, we were able to join and connect in that. And that's how Jesus works. It's always through the joining. Very light, very connecting. But in the end, that's the kind of communication we want to have. We don't want to people please. We don't want to just retell 
stories over and over as if they're our identity, because they really aren't. We want to tell a story with a purpose. And, and that purpose we want to be shining and clear so that we're both blessed by the telling of it. And we're both lifted up. We're both in joy with it. And then that's kind of how it goes when you start to just have more, just more of a prayerful life, you just start to, you're not just going to throw words around or just banter and just to say something just to be saying it. You want it to be purposeful. You want it to really be from your heart. And really that's what everyone wants. So, you know, it's not like you're going way out to left field. You're actually going towards what will bring a blessing to everyone. And that's, I think, in the end when you start to say, Jesus, Holy Spirit, then speak through me. Let, let my words bring a blessing to the whole world. That's what I liked about the Bible. I call it the red letters, you know, red letter scriptures. I like that they put in Jesus' words in red letters. And then I started to associate those red letters with, He's speaking for the whole universe. This is not a man <laughs> speaking. These teachings and these words are for the whole universe. He's, he's offering a blessing for the one. From the one, for the one. And I said, I want to, to be like that. Yeah. So that's, that's how we don't make anybody special. You know, we just start to be very prayerful, like what, what is helpful for the whole? instead of for a person or... Because it just doesn't help. You know, guru worship just sets up dependencies and, you know, you just end up having... you just have something else to undo, you know. In the end, you know, that's all you can chalk that up and say, well, wait a minute, this is... this is like idol worship. So you have a respectfulness that's for everything and everyone in you that's... that's the whoosh feeling. That's the expansive feeling. It's not... It's not to be confined. And yeah, I like how Jesus always was saying, why do you call me good? God is good. He's always pointing to God, always pointing back to the Creator. That's the way to stay humble. <laughs> Just point to the Creator with everything. Yeah. Yeah. We've got a couple. Pass right down the line. <laughs> I have what feels like a related question. Um, it's about kind of re-entry into a world that of beings that don't think this way and don't have this background. And how to avoid, I'm sure you experienced this at least 100,000 times, how to avoid a screeching halt when you're trying to have a conversation from this perspective to those who don't have this lens. Um, I'm thinking about my mother who really believes that she's sick in many different ways and has everyone around her convinced that she's sick in many different ways and trying to talk to her and say this is all just in your mind and you can get up and walk anytime you choose probably is not going to have an immediate happy result. Um, or in my work with children and families, a lot of them with a lot of trauma. Um, trying to have this conversation with them in that way is probably not immediately going to be helpful. Um, and I'm thinking of something that Nani said to me earlier, that you have to use words that people can hear and things that they can understand little by little. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any concrete guidance about how to have those conversations in a way that will be helpful and productive um, while still remaining true to this vision. Yeah, I think, I think just your desire for the, for it to be that way is is important because that's like the prayer of the heart is to say, okay, I want to surrender my old way of of thinking. I have to have some answers, or I have to address uh, people in a certain way. I think the more we start to relax into that, and we start to realize that it's it's our peace of mind that is what is so important. And, the, and then the words can trickle out from that peaceful state. And when we're not feeling 
peace, then then we begin to get into a habit of just kind of pausing or maybe closing our eyes for a moment or just connecting and, and saying, be with me, go before me, show me, lead me. You know, it, it takes the pressure off of thinking we have to come up with the individually the, the right words to say as a, as a therapist or as a son. Um, like I just mentioned with Lily and my grandmother, it just came that one day where it came as a joyful inspiration to, to just let the Spirit come through me and the word, and say the words, what, what's the point of the story, you know? <laughs> if David didn't come up with that one, <laughs> that would have been the last thing David would have tried, saying to Lillian, you know, what's the point of the story? But I could feel the strength and the presence and it was, and the follow through. It was very light and, and then she started joining with, uh, with that direction very quickly. So, I think that's the thing is, is when, like, the section rules for decision is, is so helpful. Decide the kind of day that you want and say to yourself, if I make no decisions by myself, this is the day will be given me. But it starts to wash away this idea that we have to, to decide ahead of time what we're going to do. Like if you're, you've had all these interactions with your mother and you start to think, well, I'll go visit her again, but I'm going to I'm starting to feel some things, but I'm still going to face this, 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 this. It's still a bit of this, um, like trying to figure it out or trying to pre-plan a little bit, pre-plan the encounter. And that's what we're hoping, we're praying to be washed away from, so that we, we show up without a, an agenda. Uh, we show up without a plan of action. You know, we just show up in presence and then we let the Spirit gently come through us. And it's also part of that, I will step back and let him lead the way because, because the Spirit really knows where we can be truly helpful and where it, it's not going to uh, be helpful. You know, we have to, we have to start to become more intuitive to, and prayerful when, who were to meet, if we're to say anything at all, sometimes it's a gentle smile or a hug is the absolute maximum that can be offered. But, but we're more surrendered into that prayer of being truly helpful, like of not trying to uh, pre-plan or preconceive even how the encounter would go. And it, I definitely, it does take practice because we, we have a whole history of doing it one way, and now this seems to be a very new way, a very new direction. So I know f for me, I mean I did counseling um, in different jobs that I had. I remember I was uh, working as a, as a job coach and a job trainer at a, at a, at a Goodwill Rehabilitation Center and um, there was one new client that came in and apparently he'd been in the system long before I was there. He'd multiple diagnosis, multiple drug prescriptions. Um, everybody around me was telling me he was like a total mess. Uh, David, oh no, you got this guy, Doug, and now you will really see uh, how difficult it is to be a coach and to counsel with this guy. This is a, this is a counselor's nightmare. Uh, but I remember I was I was studying the course at the time, and I just kept praying, and and Jesus was just saying, no, no, don't listen to any of that. Don't have any preconceived ideas when this guy comes in for the intake uh, interview. Don't it's just you're meeting him for the first time. You have no idea. Uh, just stay in prayer and just see this as a beautiful, fresh, clean, crisp, holy encounter. Don't take anything that they've said <laughs> seriously. In fact, they started, part of my job, they started bringing me stacks of his uh, charts for years that they had on their times. He'd walked off the job and all these cussed people out and everything. And, and Jesus just, just push all that aside. Don't read any of it. And don't 
pay attention to anything that people are saying. So when he finally came in for the intake interview, I remember sitting there across from him and he just looked at me and he smiled and he had a little sparkle in his eye and he just was so relaxed and he just started right away sharing the most amazing stuff. <laughs> Uh, it just came like he was channeling it. it just came through him through him through him right there in the intake interview and finally after like 10 minutes I said Where did you learn all this? And he said the Holy Spirit of course <laughs> and I was just like, Holy Jesus <laughs> I thought <laughs> So here Jesus telling me to just be in the moment, listen, enjoy, and it was such a blessing, and we had such a close connection. It just, that's how it got off to the start, and, and it was very miraculous connection, because it just went more miraculous from there. But, but what I, I was really told to do was, you know, I mean, I, I had a lot of counseling classes and, and psychology classes at that point, and, and, and I was, this was like a co-op, uh, a job that I had, but I was basically being taught to suspend my preconceptions and and offer it over and let this be used by the Spirit. And it had striking results, very striking results. And that that was very convincing, you know, for me to, okay, I, I have all these learned things that I've learned as part of my psychotherapy psychological training and me suspending that allowed for the miracle to come through. And and even the pamphlet that Jesus dictated, uh, what's he called the psychotherapy purpose, process, and practice. In that pamphlet, Jesus says, healing occurs the instant the therapist forgets to judge the patient. What a sense! I mean, with all the psych psychotherapy training I have, healing occurs the instant that the therapist forgets to judge the patient. That's one of those things that said, oh, that really brings it back to, it's my lesson. It's my lesson, it's my mind. Even in the movie last night, you know, when, when he was on the highway in the truck, and then the plane came over, he he the coordinates, he was like, out of anywhere in the world, for him to be witnessing that, he did take that as some kind of message for him. He still wasn't sure <laughs> what it was, he still wanted to play the hero and, and, and took it in kind of an egoic way, but he still was aware there was, it was definitely for him, this was not a random occurrence, that he was right there at those coordinates on the highway at that time. So, yeah, that's what I would, I would do, uh, because oftentimes if you, if you start to have a spiritual awakening and then you want to extend it to mom, uh, I had the same thing, you know, I, I had course groups, and I, big experiences, big experiences, and then when I go to extend it to mom, she just listened and then she said, I already have a minister. <laughs> that was the, that was the, that's how that miracle <laughs> expression went. I already have a minister. And then, then another time shortly thereafter that, the, she listened and listened and she said, hmm, I think you need to find other people to share these ideas with. And, I eventually saw that that was the Holy Spirit speaking both times. <laughs> I don't need, I already have a minister and you need to find other people. Which for somebody who was shy and just beginning, both of those were important. Don't try to change anybody's mind, just watch your own mind and try to be truly helpful. And let the Holy Spirit bring to you the ones that are capable of receiving the miracle so that both you and this person will will be blessed you see it's really a it's really about letting the, the miracles come through and be inspired versus trying to determine who should get the miracle and that's 
probably the oldest trick in the book. Mom. <laughs> You're thinking, Mom, oh, she's, she's sick. She believes all these things. She needs a miracle. And you really have to go back to, to Jesus and say, where, where would you have me go today? You know, what would you have me do? That starts to open the parameters up and, you know, then you don't have this situation where you're trying to figure out how to change somebody. Yeah. Thanks. Beautiful. All right, coming down the line here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I felt like um, this week has been so phenomenal just from the standpoint of for me, and I felt like as a group, loosening, kind of unwinding from beliefs around perception. And I I um, really liked the conversation that came up around, you know, that movie Perfect Sense, how the ego or the senses are in cahoots with the ego, um, using the levels of mind, and ultimately how the brain, mind is not in the brain. And, you know, I'm I just want to express I'm, I'm really continuing to be willing to kind of unwind from that because my particular classroom is analyzing the fidelity and the acuity of the brain and uh, its processes. Um, it's essentially its ability to perceive um, in children with uh, chronic health conditions. And it goes to the extent where three to four day, days out of the week, I'm in the operating room or in a monitoring unit where we're stimulating parts of the brain. Zap! Child can't speak. Zap! I can't remember that. Zap! I can't feel my left arm. And so, yeah, I'm just really kind of wanting, I'm open and just kind of wanting to kind of feel into what, you know, what do I do in those situations? How do I, how do I see that? Um, you know, what's coming up in my own mind, and what's most helpful? Well, I think it, it starts to, to get clear once we start to realize that it doesn't, any given situation that is, is only for one purpose, and that's for us to teach and learn uh, who we are. So every single situation, even though there seems to be trillions and gazillions of different situations, that they all have the same purpose behind them. And they're all about one thing, and that's identity. It's not really about all the different things that are learned. Because when we get into learning and education and science and professions and everything, then it seems to be, it gets into specialization. And now instead of general practitioner doctors, we have ones that work with stimulating parts of the brain, with working just with children, with, you know, working with very, very, very specific things. And yet the, the course and Jesus are taking us to, to transfer the training, to start to generalize the principles, and to start to see that the principles and the miracles are equally applicable to every situation without exception. So it's actually going in a different direction from specialization. It's going more towards unification of consciousness, unification of awareness. And as far as our specific skills and abilities and roles, you know, basically it still comes back to what, what I am teaching I'm teaching myself. It's like my mind is constantly teaching and learning. Uh, the mind never really sleeps. The mind is extremely powerful. It's always active. Even when, um, when you're trying to meditate and you have different thoughts going through your mind, um, Jesus is saying, yeah, essentially when you're having these thoughts of the past and future, your mind is actually blank. That's not the word that we would often give to blank, we wouldn't call it blank. We would say, I'm, I'm preoccupied with a lot of nothing. <laughs> but blank is not exactly the word. But he's saying it's literally blank because it's, it's not still and present. It needs to go through mind training. But in the end, I, I think it comes down to just something simple as starting to see that, wow, my attitude is teaching. 
So instead of getting too caught up in methodology and too caught up into trying to deliver a specific um, type of form and methodology, it's starting to feel like, wow, my attitude is teaching, my kindness is teaching, my patience is teaching, my tolerance is teaching, you know, my attitude, my state of mind is doing the teaching. And, and that starts to orient us to pay closer attention uh, instead of getting kind of lost into the, the role. Um, oh, I get paid to do this and I need to do what I'm trained and paid to do. Uh, in the end, you know, our mind training and our attitude is, is very, very important. So, I find that even with the skills that we learn in this world, they can, they are used. Uh, I know my 10 years of university, the vocabulary still gets used. Um, and different skills and abilities that we have picked up, like you said, you know, you have picked up a lot, those can be very well used, but just from a different purpose. You know, it's just like giving them all over to say, here, you use them for your purpose. And, and, and then as we get more into that, it starts to feel a little more involuntary, like we're not trying to assess and figure out. We're getting away from diagnosing, assessing things. You know, that's, that's very much a part of specialization, is assessment and diagnosis. And that is still saying that the problem is in form, and that we can be, become educated to find the problems in the form. And that's another trick, because the problems aren't really in the form, they're in the perception of the form. So that's back to the mind. So, yeah, I think it's beautiful. It's, that's why I think it's the curriculum, though the, the purpose is the same, which is forgiveness, the curriculum is highly individualized, meaning, you know, you can't really compare and contrast uh, the, the special functions that anyone has, because that just, you know, leads away from the, the peace, the state of mind. But it's quite uh, amazing to, to just practice surrendering. You know, I, I know I'm good friends with uh, Tamara and her mother, Judy Scotch Whitson, passed away, but they were not alike. Last time uh, uh, Svava and I went on and did an interview with uh, Tamara, she was telling, like, oh, my mother and I were just not alike at all. She's kind of very, she's kind of, uh, Tamara's intuitive and psychic, and she's not into really organizing. She likes more like fly by the seat of your pants, uh, and her mother was was very bright and very brilliant as a as an as an academic as a teacher, um, but that's part of how the forgiveness works. You know, it's it's finding how to connect <laughs> when on the surface you seem to be very very different psychologically, very different, even physically they seem to be very different in their sizes and shapes and everything, and yet it was like, a, I sensed from Tamara, it was like a constant surrendering, surrendering, and and I think that's that's kind of the thing you have to do even when you are operating with seams in a profession, with a specific job, you have to practice surrendering it over, like a quiet little prayer of, okay, you you lead me in this one, and you show me show me the way, because it starts to to get back to listen and follow, instead of lead, and then when things go wrong, help. <laughs> this is more humble. Listen and follow. Listen and follow. Listen and follow. And uh, there's even a workbook lesson that really has this is very helpful, and it's in the workbook lesson is I choose the second place to gain the first. You see how that's the undoing of the egos I can invent myself. 
I choose the second place to gain the first. There's a humbleness to that. There's a, there's a sense of, show me. I need to be shown. And this world, when we get into specialization, it's, it reminds me of that programming that happens in the movie The Island, where they, the, all of the, the agnates are, are conditioned. You are special. You're special. <laughs> it's just repeatedly. Yeah. You're special. You know, this is, no, no, I choose the second place to gain the first. I would step back and let him lead the way. And that starts to, things still happen, and, and there could be miraculous things that come through, even using the, the skills and the learning that you have. There is a, a medical doctor that contacted me many years ago. He ended up um, uh, writing a book. Uh, Rod, Rod Chelberg is his name. But he contacted me when he was working in an emergency room in a hospital on the East Coast. And he started to have so many miracles in the emergency room that he just started to pray and pray and pray more often, which is not typical of, of a surgeon in an emergency room. He just prayed more. And then more and more he had miracles and miracles. But his question was, where is this leading? Like, uh, like am I going to be a surgeon if I, if I keep having these miracles? And I said, well, you, for now, this is exactly how it works. You're being used, the, the, what you believe in is being used to the max. But I, I said, I, I, think, um, I think he loved to live in the woods, he had, I think a couple sons, and he, he could feel he was drawn more and more inward. And then eventually, I think he, he did leave that whole situation and, and he wrote this book, which was about his his transformation to go from the surgeon to into the miracle worker. And those are very helpful books. We have another friend, uh, Seema, who's a medical doctor, and she just started to get more and more into our stuff, more teachings. She ended up writing a book. She, she called me, she said, David, you're in this chapter. <laughs> you know, this and this. Another friend, D. Patrick Miller, uh, who, who published Disappearance of the Universe, he was writing a book, something maybe like Living a Course in Miracles, and, and he interviewed me and he, he said, David, you're in this chapter on the happy dream. <laughs> he, put me, he put a chapter later on in his book on the happy dream. But that, it's just, it will be a natural progression, you know, it's not like you, try, you have to try to run away from the symbols, you just have to let them be used with integrity, meaning with guidance. And then little by little, you, you start to have more expansive experiences, and then things can seem to just fall away, just like a child quits playing with a toy at a certain point when it's no longer practical. You know, the child just leaves it because it's not, it's not fun anymore. <laughs> You know, and that's the way it goes with our with our skills in the world too. They they eventually we we eventually outgrow them, just like a child outgrows clothes and like a child outgrows the toys. You know, we we eventually outgrow them. And that's a beautiful word, outgrow. It's not like this. Oh, woe is me, and I must go and fight the ego. <laughs> I must, yeah, like a sword fight or something, you know. No, no, it's not. <laughs> outgrow, outgrow. Be natural. Yeah, be natural. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, 13 minutes. <laughs> really? I, th I thought we were like two minutes. <laughs> 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 Good. <laughs> Spacious. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um. Wow. Some know that I'm from here, and I'm going. Uh, I've been led by spirit so beautifully to do some healing of really 
uh, strained relationships in my family after I leave here. Thank God it was after I leave here was the guidance, you know, because when I got here, I was feeling a little anxious about it. I even, I sent you an email like three in the morning when I first got here. I'm writing this email to you, trying to sort it out. And, and I sent it with no internet. And I don't know where it is. You may get it when I'm connected to the internet again. So, but yeah, it's good. Uh, oh my God. Yeah, I had some some fear and doubt about it. Those are kind of tough ones. I won't go into detail, but uh, it's all good. I expect miracles are going to happen. They are, and thank you for that, all of you. Oh man, there have just been so many miracles here. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. I was on the kitchen crew. She taught me, ask, then decide. That's my, I'm learning. I'm learning here. Ask, <laughs> then decide. As you say, that's my problem. The, the one problem you have left is you decide and then you ask. So that's been a huge, huge gift. And I just want to thank you all for that. So now I have... Oh, and I'll send you another email to let you know about how all the miracles went. Okay? okay. Uh, that's good? Okay. So, now I have kind of a personal question, which you may choose not to answer, of course. But I've heard you mention breatharianism many times here. Well, a few times. And it appears you would not have pizza with us, and that you're drinking liquids now. And I'm wondering if that's your direction. It's been more like a kind of a liquidy thing for me without appetites and and uh, I think even uh, the body is part of perception but everything starts to reconfigure so it's always a lesson and listen and follow and be very intuitive with that and um, I think Svava and I we tried to have the pizza but Svava said that didn't go very well. <laughs> it's almost like that's from a that's from an ancient <laughs> ancient time. I said, yeah, we there once upon a time we were pizza lovers. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I think this is just the natural movement. You know how Jesus said, you know, I have mana from heaven, and in the east they talk about the prana energy and breatharianism and this and that. It's not, it's just like vegetarianism and it's not meant to uh, be another kind of category or box. It's just, um, you know, as you just give yourself over to purpose and everything, things, you outgrow certain things. And, and uh, food is one of those <laughs> things that, that seems to be outgrown and be outgrown and and so forth. So then it's just back to being intuitive with things. And thoroughly, I, I have so enjoyed the travels and the most of the teaching sessions I've done were, was like with Jesus. He did a lot of his teaching at the meal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's been my experience too, because I've gone around to so many places and gone, I mean, I remember one day going to LA and a, one group went with me for breakfast, then one went with me for lunch, <laughs> and then one went with me for dinner. And this was not so odd that that there was these long two, three, four hour teaching sessions. We would just shift restaurants, <laughs> uh, basically. Uh, time. Yeah, it, yeah. And so it was teaching. We were just sharing a meal and just having a beautiful, fun, laughing time. I remember... Um, Early on, I think it was maybe, I don't know when it was, maybe the early 2000s or something, I went down to Plano, Texas, and I was hosted down there by an Indian man and his wife and his daughter, <coughs> Rita. And and we were in this big suburban, uh, uh, the suburban Dallas kind of uh, house with um, lots of people coming over and like potlucks, they bring like, 
three pies and two cakes and cookies and all kinds of food. It was like, so we would have a, sessions in this big Indian house and we would all stop for lunch. So one day, I remember after like two or three days of this, Arvind, the Indian man, came to me and he he looked at me and he looked at all the food in the kitchen laid out and he go, he said, David, 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 oh, every time we put a morsel of food into our mouth, we reinforce the separation from God. It's just, it was, it was very de depressed. <laughs> every time we eat the food, we are reinforcing our separation from God. And uh, I said, Arvin, I said, why do you eat? What is the purpose of eating for you? And he said, what is the purpose? Why do I eat? Why do I eat? I think it's because I'm hungry. <laughs> and I said, that is not a good enough reason. Okay, everyone, David is going to tell us the reason. <laughs> Why are we going to eat today with all this food we have? And I said, we will eat for joy. <laughs> okay, you've heard David now. <laughs> we are going to eat for joy. And he got so happy. <laughs> and it, it shifted from every time we put a morsel of food into our mouth, we are eating, we are reinforcing the separation to... We will eat for joy! <laughs> and I tell you, that was a very joyful day. It was, it was joyful every day, but it was exceptionally <laughs> joyful that day. But that's again the shifting of the purpose. It's, it's, a, it's for joy. I mean, we have to do that with everything in our life. We, we can't categorize things as, oh, this is work, and this is struggle, I gotta get this task done, and once I get done, you know. You know, we have to get into the mindset of, of doing it for joy. And, and then we actually do feel more and more joyful when that's our purpose behind it. We, we take the, the pressure off of trying to have situations and events and tasks mean something in and of themselves. Because they don't really mean anything in and of themselves. It's all for joy. And it's all for happiness and kindness and friendliness and open, transparent communication. And, and we do get much more better at it as we relax, mm -hmm. you know. It's, at first it's a little awkward, you know, it's like, oh, okay, eat for joy, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to do that, but... but why I go to the <laughs> <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> there you go, you know, joy. it's for joy. <laughs> that's it, that's it, that's it. Okay, how are we doing? We have time for... Four minutes. Oh, <laughs> um... I had two prayers when I came to the retreat. One was to learn more about oneness, which I have, and another was to make mighty companions. And that indeed has been a great, great answer to prayer. Mm -hmm. So thank you all. This has been the most amazing time of my life. Mm -hmm. And um, we came here thinking we were strangers, and we leave here knowing we are brothers in one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's <laughs> beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, well, we've done it. We've what a beautiful we've christened the in person retreats. So Yes, Renovatio. We did it. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. So, thank you all. Thanks to everyone, yeah, that yeah. came here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, yeah. <laughs>